be announced this year. Um, actually, uh, quite a tragedy because the first manufacturing facility was supposed to go into Haiti. I'm not sure if that'll happen now. But uh, Janine Benyus, my business partner, has teamed up with Paul Hawken, and they have a incredibly efficient, low-cost, locally producible solar cell that beats anything out of the water that will be coming. They're going to announce it this year. Clinton was supposed to announce it at the uh, Global Climate Initiative and got into the politics of Haiti. And now there's politics and logistics that'll make it a little more challenging. But we'll see what'll happen because it can completely transform the solar industry. Informed by green chemistry, informed by biology. BioWave comes out of Australia mimics the way a sea fan moves on the floor, a tuna fish moves through the water, and the way kelp attaches to the ocean floor. And these small units are able and capable of generating about 10 kilowatts. They're quite small. You can put them on the ocean floor, and they'll generate the power without having the huge effects that a lot of these wave-based um, hydro and, and ocean-based energy systems do attached with multiple pylons, like a kelp would attach with multiple tenons. Eastgate is in Harare, Zimbabwe, right next to the equator. It has no air conditioning unit. It's based on the passive cooling of the termite mound. McPierce was the architect, and he sat down with some termite biologists, and he said, how do the termites do it? The termites stay a consistent, for them, 87 degrees is a lovely temperature, all right? And they stay a consistent 87 degrees if it's freezing outside or if it's 120 degrees outside. Sorry, I'm not, can't do the Celsius conversion on the fly. But this Eastgate building, without an HVAC system, stays a constant 24 degrees C, independent of the outside temperature. Energy bills are 90% cheaper. The only thing they do is run a few fans at night to pull in the night cool. Arup was the engineering firm on that. It starts, this is how biologists start their jokes. Um, what do a sea kelp, a humpback whale, and an owl have in common? They walk into a bar. Right? What do they have in common? It turns out they're all incredibly fascinating flow forms. The first one, the kelp, has been the inspiration for Pax fans. It comes out of a company called Pax Scientifics in California. It turns out RMI estimates that 40% of all energy consumption worldwide goes to running pumps, fans, and motors. Those big cargo ships that we saw that shipped that stuff across the Pacific to us from China, to our computer fans, HVAC, pumps and systems, 40%. And they all have a fan. And if you can improve the efficiency of the fan, you have a huge impact on global energy consumption. The applications in which they've applied this fan have a minimum of 5% improvements and a maximum they've seen up to 75% improvements in efficiency because of that curve, that Fibonacci curve, right? It's, the, it's related to the golden mean, the golden spiral, many of you may know, and it shows up everywhere in nature and it's had this amazing results with their fan. The humpback whale, see those little bumps on the front of the fin? They're called tubercules. They actually are really, really important for helping the whale move through the water and make very, very tight turns. Um, pretty important that a whale is able to do that. It's how it feeds. This gentleman um, started a company uh, with a tubercule technology, of course. The company's called Whale Power. His name is Dr. Frank Fish, which is kind of appropriate, although whales are not fish. Um, and these turbines are capable of generating electricity in areas where there was never enough wind speed for all the other traditional turbines. So they're very, very good at, at pulling energy out of really, really low wind environments and thereby really expanding the scope and the possibilities of where we can put wind power. This last one is inspired by the owl feather. It's called the owlet. Owls are incredibly quiet. Nobody wants to be heard if you're trying to catch that mouse 
with your, you know, your feathers whistling through the wind. And so this company in Germany um, put little serrations on the ends of its fan blades, mostly for quiet, but they found upwards of 18% improvement in energy efficiency because there was less drag. So Pax Fan, Whale Power, and Zeal Abic. This is in Japan. The bullet train, formerly known as bullet train, now known as Shinkansen, a part-time birder was an engineer on the project and was challenged by the fact that these super fast high-speed trains were creating pressure gradients when they went through the tunnels that created a sonic boom when they came out of the tunnel. Not too popular with the villages on the other sides of these tunnels. And so he asked himself, you know, and thought about this amazing bird in the middle that's called the kingfisher. It's almost on every continent on the planet. If it, it can dive into the water and catch a fish, it must do it without creating a splash. It's basically moving from one density medium to another density medium without creating a pressure wave, which is exactly what that train is doing. One density medium, the compressed air from the speed inside of the tunnel to the open air on the other side of the tunnel but without a wave. And so now the Shinkansen has a beak, has a nose. This is a mimicking form, just like the Kingfisher. They too eliminated the sound and found huge increases in fuel efficiency. J.R. West is the company. This is a Mercedes-Benz concept car. The engineers went to the aquarium and said, what flow forms in nature look the most efficient, and we're quite pleased to learn that it wasn't necessarily a shark, because it's awfully uncomfortable to sit in a shark car, but it was a box fish, right, which is a lot easier for to accommodate us upright humans, and it, when they put a box fish model in a wind tunnel, it had perfect airflow efficiency, basically the drag coefficient of zero. And so they emulated that form. This car gets 30 kilometers per liter, and it's not a hybrid. It's just a regular little gasoline engine, 70 miles to the gallon. We've been talking a lot about plastics just now, and, well, what are we going to do? We need our plastics. We could recycle them. We could get them from oil. Well, what oil is is long-chain hydrocarbons, right? Carbon, hydrogen, carbon, hydrogen, carbon, hydrogen. Well, that's what sugars are, all right? And that's why we were able to get oil, because all these plant sugars eventually compressed and turned into oil. Well, how does life make plant sugars, right? Or how do plants make plant sugars? They grab carbon dioxide from the air and combine it with water, CO2, H2O, put them together, and you get a hydrocarbon. Right? What a beautiful, simple process. Then when we burn hydrocarbons, we produce water and CO2. That's the easy chemistry, back and forth. A gentleman by the name of Jeffrey Coates said, well, gosh, if, like, what, 28 million plants can figure out how to do this, shouldn't I, with my big brain, be able to figure out how to do this? And so he actually developed a designer catalyst, and in conjunction with lemon peels, is making plastic out of carbon dioxide gas. Think of that. Do we have a sort of abundant source of CO2 gas we might want to use up somewhere, right? Although sadly, he said, if we were to make all of our plastic from CO2 gas, it would only consume 3% of the CO2 that we're producing today, which shows you how much CO2 we're producing relative to how much plastic we think we're actually making. So Novamur is the company based out of Boston.